there is a great diversity of living beings on our wonderful planet. They can be found almost anywhere. In the depths of the oceans, in the Earth's interior and in air currents high up in the atmosphere. Even volcanoes were found to harbor microorganisms adapted to the harsh conditions there. There are around 3 million species of living organisms on Earth, some of them of the most fascinating makeup. From primitive bacteria to higher order vertebrates and anthropods. However, it took a long while for this diversity to establish itself. The evolution of life on Earth was anything but linear. There were periods of higher diversity as well as periods of almost total extinction. This was deduced following the analysis of fossils unearthed at paleontological digging sites. In the past 540 million years, there have been five major and about 20 minor extinction events. However, the most global crisis of our planet's biosphere occurred much earlier, approximately 2.1 billion years ago. The first living organisms are posited to have appeared on Earth rather early, approximately but not quite 4 billion years ago. That is about 400 million years after the planet's surface had become more or less suitable for life. Even so, the Earth of that period can't have looked hospitable. Barren rocks, dense clouds, frequent storms and earthquakes and an atmosphere devoid of oxygen, made up of mostly nitrogen, methane and carbon dioxide. This was the age of primitive microorganisms, archaea and bacteria, most of which used anoxygenic photosynthesis, that is a kind of photosynthesis where oxygen is not produced. Apart from these creatures, it is thought that there were many forms falling in between that couldn't be classified as either living beings or not living objects with a satisfying degree of certainty. About 2.7 billion years ago, there emerged oxygenic photosynthesis, the kind of photosynthesis familiar to us where oxygen is produced. This form is still used by the overwhelming majority of plants and unicellular algae. Anaerobic organisms cannot live in an oxygen-rich environment. That is why ancient algae used oxygen as a weapon. They released it as a byproduct of their life activity, and this waste killed their competitors. This way, algae not only protected their turf, but also spread further to cover larger areas to dwell on. At first, oxygen was spent on oxidation of rocks in habitats of aerobic organisms' colonies. In this manner, oxygen pockets were formed. Small areas of oxidized minerals. Gradually, oxygen went on to spread in the atmosphere, oxidizing methane, sulfur compounds and iron. Not able to exist in an environment rich in oxygen, most anaerobic organisms died out with those of them remaining around confined to underground pockets where oxygen didn't reach. Thus the tables were turned in the biosphere, with the oxygen-breathing organisms becoming the majority and spreading across larger areas, and the former planet owners forced to remain in some limited areas. With the spread of the new organisms, the content of gases like methane and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere dropped. Methane oxidized forming water, and eventually carbon dioxide, with the latter taking active part in photosynthesis. All this reduced the greenhouse effect, and the Earth's surface considerably cooled. The so-called Huronian glaciation started approximately 2.1 billion years ago, and continued for about 300 million years until the Sun's luminosity and tectonic makeovers had heated up the Earth. This was a time when single-cell microorganisms were evolving extremely slowly constantly thwarted by an occasional prolonged global ice age. The period has earned a great number of nicknames like the Great Oxidation or Oxygenation Event, Oxygen Catastrophe and Oxygen Crisis to name but a few. Even though not really swift, this event was definitely large-scale and global. Practically all the biodiversity of the non-oxygen period was eliminated and evolution was greatly hampered by global glaciation for a good billion years. However, in the aftermath, there emerged a more energy-efficient method of nutrition. Approximately 540 million years ago, the Phanerozoic eons started, sometimes referred to as the period of visible life. 
It was peculiar for vigorous evolution of multicellular species, and in fact it is actually still in progress. Many creatures of that age looked really bizarre and didn't resemble any of their today's descendants. Suddenly, about 450 million years ago, some unknown factor abruptly interfered with the active evolution of life forms. The proposed causes include a cosmic gamma ray burst, volcanic activity and even a large celestial object impact. As it is, from 25 to 50 percent of all living beings became extinct within 7 million years. This series of extinction events, dubbed the Ordovician Silurian Extinction, was hard on trilobites, mollusks and some other marine invertebrates of the time. The late Paleozoic era that followed this extinction event heralded active evolution of flora on land. The first amphibians and reptiles emerged in that time too. Fishes were actively evolving, establishing their dominance in all freshwater and saline bodies of water. Approximately 372 million years ago, the so-called Devonian extinction started. It occurred in several stages that were alternately followed by comparatively peaceful periods. Peaceful they may have been, but even so, the extinction rate of species was higher than average. The most likely reason for this extinction is posited to be this. Land plants of the time sported long and powerful roots, which enabled them to extract nutrients from much deeper down in the soil than before. When water seeped through soils that were loosened by plants' roots, great amounts of nutrients were washed into the ocean. As a result, algae were positively thriving there, in the abundance of food and light. The rotting of these algae reduced oxygen dissolved in the water and the organisms inhabiting the sea bottom were simply smothered with nothing to breathe. In the aftermath, about 70% of the marine species at that time are estimated to have died out, including practically all species forming coral reefs. This triggered global irreversible changes in the biosphere of the global ocean. Many genera and families vanished completely and the vacated space was filled by others. In the Carboniferous period which followed, tree ferns exploded in numbers all over the planet's surface. Also, there emerged gymnosperm trees and conifers. It is in this period that rich deposits of coal were formed, which is still widely used by mankind in various industries. Speaking about the fauna, this was the time when insects thrived that's when the giant millipede Arthropleura was around, which measured two and a half meters. The Meganeura, a giant dragonfly with a wingspan of up to one meter. And the Pumina scorpius, a scorpion measuring 70 centimeters. The insects were of these unbelievable sizes on account of exceptionally high concentrations of oxygen in the atmosphere, which at that time reached a staggering 35%. The Permian-Triassic extinction event also informally referred to as the Great Dying, occurred about 251-253 million years ago, marking the transition from the Permian to the Triassic period. It proved to be the most massive and global in the entire history of multicellular life. Diggings show that up to 95% of marine species and up to 70% of land species vanished from the face of the Earth as a result. Interestingly, this disaster was rather swift by geological standards. It took just up to 200,000 years. Later, it would take not less than 50 million years for biodiversity to recover for land species and about 100 million years for marine species. Trilobites, a great number of marine invertebrates and microorganisms were on the verge of extinction. Insects shrank in size. They stopped looking like horror film creatures on the loose and instead assumed an appearance of today's tiny and numerous creatures. The reasons for the Permian-Triassic extinction event still haven't been established with certainty. Among the proposed hypotheses, we may single out robust volcanic activity as one of the most likely ones. Others worth mentioning are a collision of our Earth with a large celestial object, climate change and active methane emissions following biological or tectonic activities. There is no single answer to this question yet. In the Triassic period, which followed the Permian-Triassic extinction event, vertebrates vigorously evolved. 
This is when archosaurs emerged, the prehistoric saurians, crocodiles and dinosaurs were to evolve from. The Triassic period also produced first mammals, although they were not so widespread at that time. About 200 million years ago, the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event began, sometimes called the End Triassic Extinction. Having lasted for approximately 10,000 years, it marked the transition from the Triassic to the Jurassic period. The event claimed about half of known species on the Earth of that time. They included various reptiles and amphibians that vacated a number of ecological niches. This allowed dinosaurs to establish their dominance on the planet and sustain it for the next 130 million years. Incidentally, the reasons for the Untriassic extinction event are not known either. And in fact, there isn't a single hypothesis today that would sound sufficiently convincing. The Jurassic and Cretaceous periods that followed the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event were the times when dinosaurs thrived and flourished. But these giant saurians were not the sole inhabitants of our planet at the time. This is when the forefathers of today's birds, flowering plants and corals evolved, as well as small, furry, warm-blooded animals, mammals. Even though these small creatures didn't look quite as impressive compared to tremendous dinosaurs in all their glory, they firmly held their ecological ground and steadily progressed in their evolution. Mammals got their chance at the end of the Cretaceous period, that is about 66 million years ago. What occurred then was the most well-known and a rather large-scale mass extinction event referred to as the Cretaceous Tertiary Extinction Event. According to the first and most popular hypothesis, the extinction was caused by a giant celestial object impact. Everyone would have heard of a meteorite supposedly killing off all dinos. Nevertheless, there is no hard evidence in favor of this version. Either way, the upshot was that all dinosaurs died out, alongside a great number of conifers, algae and mollusks. The Cretaceous Tertiary Extinction Event heralded the beginning of a new geologic era, the Cenozoic, which is still in progress. Throughout this era, mammals, birds and flowering plants have been actively evolving and spreading across the Earth. Mammals settled all over the planet, inhabiting it literally everywhere, from tropical areas to ice caps at the poles, and from the depths of the oceans and the planet's interior to air currents up high. Eventually, evolution produced mankind. Even though you would expect people today to be enlightened enough, there are still those who do not believe in evolution. However, the theory of evolution is not something to believe in, it is a scientific theory based on facts. The theory of the evolution of species has come a long way and has undergone serious revisions since its original version proposed by Charles Darwin back in 1859. Still, the basic principles of the theory are the same, and to date, the theory of evolution is the only serious scientific theory that accurately describes the process of the evolution of species and the origin of new creatures. According to some scientists, we are now living in the epoch of the sixth mass extinction event. They also call it the Holocene or Anthropocene extinction. Thousands of species have died out in the past 10,000 years, Around 900 species have vanished from the face of the Earth in the past 500 years. Today, about 40% of amphibian species and 25% of mammal species are under the threat of extinction, and it looks like one of the chief reasons for this is human activity. Will humanity be able to tackle this threat? Will life go one step further up the order, as it was always the case after every major mass extinction event? There is no way of knowing it now. The Earth's biosphere boasts a great potential for recovery and evolution, which by no means implies that it doesn't need our care. After all, the Earth is our only home. Dear friends, what are your views on all this? You can always share your opinion in the comments below. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to give us a thumbs up, and if you want to be the first to find out about newly posted videos, you're welcome to subscribe. If you haven't yet done so, let's keep in touch.